get started. All right, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today. So we, uh, we looked at, at uh, what a panic would look like. There's an awful lot going on with uh, school, getting kids back into school, uh, not just because of COVID-19, uh, and I'm John Sullivan uh, with ADI, not just because of COVID-19, but also from a safety standpoint. And uh, it's always on the forefront of our minds, uh, has been for decades with the challenges that have gone on in the, uh, in the K through 12 and even the universities uh, out there in the marketplace. That being the case, we brought on some, uh, 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 some people in the industry that come from uh, uh, manufacturers, supplier partners, and also integrators that uh, really understand and uh, help to support the structures in schools and, uh, and wanna create a safe environment. Uh, even in Illinois, where I'm from, uh, I was announced by the governor two days ago that uh, they will be setting up plans to go back to school in the fall, which uh, has been on our minds. Uh, and, and for many people with kids at home, uh, we, know, uh, we know that it's, uh, it's uh, just trying to figure out how the e-learning works and what the future looks like and uh, uh, colleges and, and so forth. And uh, uh, that being said, uh, that's the plan that they're going to let the district set up around uh, some, some guide, guidelines and some rules and getting these kids back in. So that being the case, we're in the summer. This is the opportunity to upgrade systems. It's the opportunity to introduce new technologies and uh, hopefully get those installs uh, uh, out there and done prior to uh, school starting. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just introduce the team uh, that we have on. So let me start with, uh, with uh, uh, Chris Ebert. So, uh, uh, Chris, if you could say a little bit about yourself, please, and your company, that would be awesome. He's uh, Director of Sales Midwest for Aphone. So, Chris, can you tell us a little bit, please? Yeah, great. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I've been in the security industry for 13 years, 11 of which uh, with Aphone, and two of those have been with a uh, IP uh, camera slash VMS manufacturer. I started as a regional sales manager with Aphone in 2007 and ultimately assumed the role of Midwest Director of Sales for iPhone in 2018. Um, I've worked extensively with schools over the last 13 years, uh, you know, assessing their ever-changing needs due, due to a variety of events that have happened over that time frame, um, which demand a, a very evolving sales approach and products. Uh, Aphone itself has been in North America for 50 years, and uh, Aphone, as most know, is a global leader in the intercom and general communication solutions. Um, some of the products that Aphone offers in light of uh, recent events feature touchless intercom, mobile answering from personal devices, and centralized communication that help accommodate, you know, potential staffing issues and, and to limit exposure in general. So, thank you. And uh, uh, TJ Dixon, uh, VP Sales and Marketing from Spico Technologies. Uh, TJ, tell us a little about yourself, please, and in, uh, in your organization. Sure. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I am uh, TJ Dixon. I've been with uh, Spico Technologies for about 16 years now. Uh, Spico, if you don't know us, we are a manufacturer of uh, video surveillance, access control, commercial audio, uh, and now uh, temperature uh, screening or monitoring. So, um, you know, we're excited to be on the call uh, to talk about some of the things and uh, some of the solutions that we have for uh, the K through 12 higher education. We've done uh, several installs or uh, are in uh, several um, uh, higher ed uh, with our secure guard servers, VMS, uh, pulling in our access control and video together with a, you know, a, an integration piece. So uh, we're excited to talk to you today about a couple of things that we can do as we get back, uh, you know, get into uh, school coming up and, and hopefully and possibly opening, um, what we can do to help uh, mitigate some of the concerns that are out there. So we're happy to be here and thank you for having us. John, you're muted. Thank you. I thought that would help. David Antar, thank you, David. Uh, I, I think he might be the most technology-wise person on the call, but I'm not clear yet, at least on Zooms. Uh, David Antar, uh, I'm president of uh, IP Video Corp. David? Thank you, John. Uh, IP Video is a 30-year-old company that I started, and we started as an innovation company. We were actually the first access camera dealer in the United States in 1996, and we're really early um, adopters of IP technology and security technology. Uh, right now, IP Video um, has over 600 dealers in the U.S. and Canada for our products that we bring to market. 
We're also extremely expert in the education space. We've been in education since 1998, bringing all kinds of innovations and things to the education market. IP Video has three main products that we bring to market through our dealers. Uh, one of them is a lecture capture recording system that we use called AV Fusion. Uh, we're in uh, many universities with that product and now starting to move into K through 12 with a lot of applications for that because it does perfect synchronization of audio and video over multiple cameras, including a desktop computer, similar to what we're doing on Zoom. Uh, the other product is ViewScan, which is a uh, very unique walkthrough metal detection system that we do have in quite a few school districts. We have 60 of them in Detroit schools. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was a cover story of Campus Security Magazine uh, last year. Uh, incredible product that's passive and is fully integrated into a video management platform. And the really exciting one is Halo, which is our IoT smart sensor, uh, which has artificial intelligence and machine learning. One of the main purposes that it's been used for in schools is for vape and vape with THC detection, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. And uh, Bruce Cannell, it's uh, uh, Education Segment Manager for Access Communications. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Bruce Cannell. I am the Segment Development Manager uh, for Access Communications. I am uh, the person that is re primarily responsible to trying to bring access to the K-12 and the higher education environment. If you're not familiar with Access Communications, I kind of tag along with David Antar a little bit. Uh, our engineers created the first IP camera back in 1995. Uh, so uh, we are now in the uh, solutions business where we're talking, trying to take uh, everything from end to end. So cameras is a big uh, part of our portfolio, but then we also have access control. We have audio, we have a, a video audio intercom on the doors, and we have lots of partners. Partners that both have uh, analytics, partners that have physical product as well. We pride ourselves on lots of partnerships to try to be the real total solution for K-12 and higher education. I myself am a former law enforcement officer. I uh, hail from, uh, uh, after retirement, I went into the school security consulting business, then the school uh, security business itself. And my last role, I was at Orange County Public Schools in Orlando, Florida as the director of their physical security. So welcome everyone. I hope we can uh, pick something up from this. A lot of smart people here and hope we can share some things with you. Thank you, Bruce. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, and Rick, you're on, you're on mute, Rick, uh, Rick Zimmerman, uh, Vice President of Security for uh, um, Corson Security out of, uh, out of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. So uh, Rick, please. Uh, thank you, John. I would like to welcome everyone and thank everyone for their time and the opportunity to kind of review the products and services we provide uh, to that higher ed space as well as the K-12 is our focus today. Um, as the Vice President of Security for Course and Fire and Security, we are soon to be 75-year-old privately held family-owned company based out of uh, Indianapolis and we protect property and assets for almost 75 years, a large presence in the fire services and products and I lead our security business and our approach to the marketplace really is a best in breed um, approach with manufacturers protecting our customers investments from a solutions and consultative selling model. Um, many people on this this call I do business with outside of just this panel discussion and we just really lean on our market leaders to help us complement the solutions we build for our customers. So with that again I appreciate everyone's time and this opportunity and um, I'll, I'll pass it back over to John. Thank you. Thank you Rick. Appreciate that. So, uh, so the way the format's going to work is I'm going to go through some questions, and uh, and then the uh, the panelists, of course, will have an opportunity to answer to those questions and give any feedback. If you have any questions out there in the audience, please feel free drop them into the Q and A tab uh, in the uh, in the chat, and uh, and we'll be happy to uh, to have dialogue around that. Or there's a Q and A actually uh, a, a piece right there when you when you're looking at your computer screen. You drop it in there, then we'll answer to that towards the end and, uh, and try to collect and, uh, and, and speak to as many as we can. So let me start it with uh, uh, what are some key steps schools, both K through 12 and higher education can take to better protect their students, staff and facilities? And then are there any steps that all the schools should take regardless of the demographics? So why don't I start out with uh, Bruce from Access and, uh, and, and maybe you can help us out, Bruce. Very well, John. Well, I've been in that position, uh, you know, uh, trying to look at what are the key steps, what are the first steps that you're looking at. If you're looking at either a 
a, a remodeling of a school or maybe building a brand new building. I would say the first thing you want to do is an assessment. I think uh, everyone would agree that, uh, that, that uh, while you may be very learned as a security director or maybe an IT director about technology, about a variety of things, when I say assessment, I'm saying I think you should be looking at uh, both uh, the, the security management piece as well as the physical security, the technology pieces. We want to complement that, and Access is all about complementing. Yes, we have product that's all based on security technology, but we have lots of partners that have nothing to do with that. For example, 3M is one of our partners that, along with a good uh, intercom access control uh, video intercom at the door, if, if someone does try to perpetrate that uh, or penetrate that building and uh, they, they can't uh, get through by the vetting process of just on, uh, you know, the video audio intercom, and they decide to try to shoot their way through, then we've got that partner who is kind of working with us to say, okay, here's a better way to, to protect it. I would also look to documents that, uh, that can help you with this. If you're not familiar with a partner for Alliance, uh, School Alliance Pass, as we call it, it's a great document, and it takes schools and assesses it from the security management or the policy procedure level, all the way to then looking at the, the parking lot, the buildings, exterior doors, inner doors, and all those things kind of run together. Just to be brief, I would just, you know, take a look at the whole building and assess it and then uh, and use someone independent to help you uh, to know where you want to go. Thank you, Bruce. So full, full assessment, partnerships and documentation, uh, big, big help. Uh, Chris Ebert from, uh, from AFONE. Yeah, to, to piggyback on that a little bit, from a perspective of intercom and devices that uh, require human inter interaction, um, I think that staff training on a continued basis and best practices are, are key. Um, dating back from when I was a, a regional sales representative, post, especially post Sandy Hook, um, I would go into any number of, of schools, and as I was well, we all know, that was in the, the fall slash winter time, and I'd be dressed in all black, wearing a big black coat and carrying two big black cases with me. And I don't think I look like I go to high school anymore, but I would press the button and people would inevitably just let me in without establishing any type of communication. And that was a alarming for me to see as a, a representative of an intercom manufacturer that people weren't utilizing the system as it was intended. And that was part of the conversation when I would deal with specifically schools and school districts that if the systems aren't implemented and used as, as they were designed to be used, then uh, the safety that they provide is somewhat of a moot point because um, of all of the reasons we are capable of, of limiting exposures within school, whether it be, you know, God forbid, a, a shooter, but also just non-custodial parents and just generally people who shouldn't be in schools. And uh, again, key is just making sure that on a, on a reoccurring basis, the um, schools themselves practice the um, best practices in terms of how they should be utilizing the features that that they're investing in. And John, uh, may I add one? May I add one? Absolutely, please, Chris. You, Chris, you really nailed it. What I would let, what I would say to you is empower your secretaries, those po those folks at the main entrance. Empower them. Give them the authority to to ask those questions and vet. You know, who, who are you here to see? Do you have an appointment? Ask the questions, the critical questions, before you just press the electric clock and let it let it release. I would I would tend to agree. The uh, but it's not just design; it's also uh, and what you put in. It's also following the procedures, right? Policies, and procedures, and and more often than not, the person who's answering the intercom in that case would be uh, uh, they 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 know quite a few of the people, especially in the K through twelve. They they know the parents. They know the people that would be showing up at the door. So uh, uh, they should. It's a very good point. Uh, what, what trends are impacting uh, school architectural design and security? Uh, Rick Zimmerman, thinking you could uh, help out there. Yep, certainly. Um, in, in recent years with um, some of the unfortunate events, obviously, one of the things I've noticed mostly in schools, um, in the past you would have a, a large opening with two door leaves or up to six or eight door leaves. And basically once you got through that first threshold, you were wide open into those spaces. So what we've seen, um, even in retrofit of existing old structures, we've seen companies come in or school corporations make decisions to build basically uh, vestibules, and it creates a, a two-layer uh, place to authenticate who's in the first layer, and then there's a voice connection, as Chris and Bruce had alluded to, and then there's an access control element possibly to limit, you know, if this person belongs on, 
on site and if, if they're a volunteer then they have credentials that allow them through the in, in, into the building but in the past it was a very open friendly you know come and meet with your kid and go to lunch but current events have actually changed the building architecture of openings and they provide all kind of different secondary credentialing and authentication before they let people actually into the buildings. Um, I think those things will lend themselves also to social distancing and, and a place where they can actually, maybe if they do some kind of a temperature evaluation, level one screening uh, for the current COVID environment. I think having a controlled area, they can do occupancy count through those spaces. But um, unfortunately, the past where schools were just part of the community and was wide open, current events um, have forced literally different building is designs. And um, in the past, I saw a lot of openings and we have conversations now in a consulting manner to where schools actually build buildings with D marks and fail secure hardware that in a duress scenario, you would force people, occupants and possibly a, the bad guy out of the structure so they can address the, the situation differently. So that's been a huge trend. There's been a lot of retrofit business for those schools in, the, in that business. And, and most new construction always has a way to control and put a D mark for verification. So I've seen that more and more um, every year. Um, and that's really one of the first things I've seen. Makes a lot of sense, Rick. I think, uh, and I, I do, I think that the, uh, um, the occupancy piece is also gonna be really important, especially now during COVID, right? Um, but uh, but also also how the system reacts upon different different situations, be it uh, uh, be it a gunshot or whatever the case is. Um, what what are some of the typical security concerns that schools have, and uh, how can you assist with them? TJ, thanks, Sean. Um, you know, I I feel like uh, you know it's funny. That, uh, I think security concerns at schools right now are anything but typical. You know, as we move forward and really start to, to drive in and see what's gonna happen with the kids going back to school. Uh, I'm, I actually have two kids, uh, one in elementary school, one moving up to middle school. And uh, you know, I'm certainly concerned as a parent. I know that uh, the teachers are concerned uh, when the kids come back to school, how, how it'll be received, how this technology is gonna be implemented. Um, and you know, from a speaker technology standpoint and what we're doing, uh, when we look at uh, where we are as far as um, being able to um, you know, try to mitigate some of those concerns, what we're doing is, um, you know, with our Secure Guard VMS, browser managed access control integrated with video uh, and pulling those together. And then uh, with our uh, thermal monitoring solution with mass detection uh, and being able to do facial recognition, we can now incorporate all three of these technologies in there, but do it in a way that's not so obtrusive to the students when they come back to school. And we, you know, talk about K through 12, higher education, uh, you know, when, when a, a child comes in and they're going to look into a panel uh, and they're going to see their face in there, we, we have, you know, ways that we can make it not over, so it's not overwhelming to them, uh, that they're not going to get bells and whistles going off. If they do have a temperature, it'll notify people via text message. Uh, it uh, will operate uh, via two-way audio to that particular panel. Uh, where we can talk to that, that child and say, hey, just step aside and, and make it an easy transition going back into these areas. So. Now, when we look at these typical concerns and uh, as Pico, we're, we're trying to offer a, you know, I guess a, a one-stop solution. And of course, integrating with some of the, the folks that are on here today um, uh, and the concerns of the parents too, uh, you know, active shooter didn't go away. Uh, you know, there's still a concern. So, you know, we integrate with gunshot detection and being able to send, uh, you know, a text alert notification to, to folks to, so they immediately know what's happening on that campus and be able to take some action right away. So. Uh, we're putting these types of solutions together, working with other manufacturers, other technologies out there uh, to put together a comprehensive solution and package. You know, we also look at Spico and we say, you know, how do we, um, you know, think a little bit bigger um, and go maybe further from the building, right? So I got to start now with, with temperature detection. I got to start possibly at the bus, right? Where they, before the kid gets on the bus and he may have a, an elevated temperature and he gets on the bus, we have to work with mobile solutions and maybe a, a mobile panel, uh, battery operated that I can you know, notify somebody before they get on the bus. The bus driver say, hey, let's get your parents here. Uh, there's gonna be new policies and procedures of how kids enter a school or enter a bus. And we're just trying to think on a larger scale. So uh, that's some of the things that we're working on today. 
Thanks, TJ. Yeah, you, you know, some I think uh, integrated solutions are awesome that you're thinking that way. I think sometimes suppliers don't go that far, and integrators need to go that far, and they need to be thinking about how how everything works together. So uh, it, it, very impressive. I was with a, a buddy last night. We were talking more about manufacturing. Uh, he's CFO for a few organizations, and uh, and has ownership in these organizations. And and in there, he's talking about how it would be easier if some pieces were integrated to include, you know, a, a touchless access control along with uh, along with the testing for temperature, right? And then we go through a couple of ideas and pieces. And, and I think that the more integrated, the easier it is to use, the easier it is, the better better chance that we're gonna have people uh, using using the rules, right? So. Yeah, that's a great point. And we're also, you know, when you look at the, the building itself, one of the security concerns that comes up all the time is who's in the building. So utilizing two-factor authentication, analytics, uh, making sure that we have the right people in the building at the right time and managing what doors are going through is critically important. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what, what role do security manufacturers play in adopting changes as a result of a problem like COVID-19 uh, that may be temporary or could be longer lasting? Uh, Chris uh, from AFO. Yeah, there have been uh, any number of change or events that have happened over the last 20 years or so that require change to security policies and procedures, whether it be 9-11, Sandy Hook, or currently COVID. Um, it's important for security manufacturers to understand that we play a really important uh, role in not only the implementation, but the utilization of devices that impact the, the safety and general well-being of students, staff, and overall communities of each school or school district, because the important thing is to note that the schools are a community center and, and everybody needs to be feel, feel safe in those community centers. So COVID-19 is unique in the sense that it's not necessarily a security concern instead of safety and general well-being issue. And I think most recognize that COVID will probably um, come and go in, in a relatively short term, I guess, pending treatments and vaccines continue to progress, but it'll absolutely leave a mark on society for the long term. And I think that security manufacturers are in a position of responsibility that require an adaptation to, size, to uh, societal changes. Um, from an intercom standpoint, some of those changes would be uh, hands-free devices in order to limit common, surface ba common surfaces being touched. Um, intercoms are generally devices that require some sort of human inter interaction on both sides of communication. Uh, meaning somebody presses the button on the outside to establish communication on the, and then somebody on the inside presses a button to release the door. And it's, a, it's a extremely important um, for us as manufacturers to realize that people may no longer feel comfortable um, touching a common surface in order to establish a communication path. So since security devices such as impl uh, intercoms are implemented for safety and um, security purposes, it's important that, that the communities feel safe while using the devices. Um, so yes, we do need to embrace change. And though not all change needs to come in the form of re-engineering products, change may come in, in the way we deliver the messaging, um, that there is potential that school's uh, current intercom solution uh, may be able to accommodate the necessary changes in the current climate, in which case um, it, may be, it may not be uh, a massive investment for um, schools to implement protocols for what could be a, a potential short-term issues. So like in the case of our IX solution, it has the ability to adapt as, uh, as a, a customer's needs evolve. That makes sense. Uh, and we do, we, we have a responsibility to present, come up with solutions, present, and, uh, and the customers or, or the, the schools, whatever the case is in this matter, they have a responsibility to uh, understand it. And it's expected by their insurance companies and so forth, and will be for, for quite a long time, unfortunately. Uh, assuming uh, we all want COVID to go away, of course, but uh, they have a responsibility to act on what we present, and uh, and that's expected. So, um, what what product strategy, including contactless openings, do you lead with when calling on a school or a district? And uh, Rick, I think you'd clearly be the best one for this. So, there's a lot of legacy environments and systems in the marketplace. So, a lot of what we would do in consulting with these customers is evaluate their existing environments. Um, budgets are gonna be more strained than they were in the past, likely with what's happening in the world. So we really would look at a product strategy to migrate them from a legacy maybe platform or if it's a new platform to a product set that would um, future-proof that investment. And, and what I mean by that is, is I kind of touched on it earlier. There are manufacturers that are market leaders 
in the integration that we're talking about um, is really a new idea in the security industry in recent years about providing standards for interoperability between different systems. So as market leaders, as manufacturers, many of which is on this call, we as a systems integration company will pick partners as part of our solution to that customer that helps them with their current needs today that will give them choices in the future. Um, and, and some of those things include mobile credentialing from key manufacturers that was a traditional card or a key fob, where we can now complement that with a frictionless or touchless mobile credential from your phone. And there's other credentials being developed that makes it more frictionless uh, from an opening. Um, we're evaluating low energy door operators. So they're not even actually physically touching the door that would be complemented with that mobile credential. Uh, TGA touched on dual authentication with, with like a mobile credential and, and a complementary credential facial rec or something. And we'd actually physically open the door so we would allow people to get in and out of a space without touching anything. Um, um, the biometric things that are coming with facial rec, um, we're starting to be able to qualify if we get to an environment again where masks are required, we can identify like go or no go with facial analytics uh, with video surveillance that would complement access control to where this person's got the right credential, but they're not wearing a mask. We're not going to allow them to open this opening. So I, I think from a consultative selling standpoint, as a security integration company, our role is to really look at the best in breed and, and take care of the customer's needs today and then leverage technology and manufacturers that we know will have a, a product roadmap that complements our, you know, what we're trying to provide for the customer. And I think in the past, I don't think we always thought past tomorrow or past next year because no, no one saw COVID coming. So there's a lot of thermal imaging, a lot of conversations in the industry right now about these solutions. We are going to go to market with long-term proven manufacturers that we have absolute confidence will support us and our customer, many of which are on this call. But uh, I think that's important for us to lead them down this path. Um, most school administrators, be it K-12 or higher ed, this isn't their day job. And we look at this from a business opportunity, but we also want to contribute to securing people, property and assets. And, and I think sometimes security integrators lose sight of the, the big goal. And I think most of us on this call would agree. So um, that's kind of in a, try to keep it brief so others may want to add to that, but that, that's kind of our approach. Good approach. I mean, coming from a you know, the parent, I have school age children like TJ, uh, we, we want that, right? One understanding and empathy and uh, really trying to get arms around the right solutions for uh, for the schools. You know, you mentioned mobile, you mentioned credentials, uh, uh, frictionless, uh, scalable, right? All, all pieces that are really important for these schools out there. Um, which, uh, as you talk about, you know, kind of hands-free, what is uh, a current demand for hands-free intercom solutions uh, within the educational sector? Uh, Chris, and I keep thinking about when I go to the kids' schools and, and uh, having to press the, you know, the, the, the A phone button and, uh, and be let in, whatever the case is, right, and uh, ask a few questions. And they, they seem to know me when I come up. There must not be a lot of short ball fat guys, but uh, maybe I'm, I'm one of the only ones at the school these days. So maybe you could answer to that, though. Well, uh, it, yeah, right now the demand's high obvi for obvious reasons, and I think manufacturers are doing a really good job uh, right now promoting solutions that fit the current needs for schools in order for people to feel safe, like as you said, as, as school uh, hopefully resumes uh, in the fall, and yeah, I've got school-aged kids as well as we're all kind of hoping school goes back, but as school decision makers become more aware of the different products, uh, that meet their needs, specifically hands-free needs, um, the demand actually continues to grow. Um, from an A-phone standpoint, we offer a few solutions, um, one being hands-free call activation uh, with a wave sensor from the outside of a building. Uh, we can integrate into third-party devices, a company called V-Link Pro that allows for communication to be established uh, based off of actually human recognition from the camera level as well as using proximity, proximity sensors and intelligent audio that would activate calls. Um, we also have the app-based um, answering from inside the building on personal devices, and this would limit the amount of times that a common device would be touched from a, an, maybe an administrative um, standpoint. So they can utilize their own phones if, if, the, um, if the administration deems it uh, capable of being done. Um, and then we also have centralized uh, capability for centralized answering centers from maybe a school district building 
as opposed to individual schools. Um, and this would be twofold. It'd be to limit exposure. And also, unfortunately, we're in a world of staff consolidations uh, due to the budget cuts that we talked about earlier. So uh, being able to answer from a, a centralized point might be a little bit more economical for them rather than having a uh, individual um, answering point from each school. So uh, the consolidation of communication also on a single platform. So we're able to, um, with the IX solution specifically, this system can act as an entryway intercom, room-to-room -room communication, a paging solution, and a VoIP uh, phone system all on one platform. And again, that's to limit the amount of devices that are being touched on a day-to-day on a -day basis from a inside the school standpoint, because we have to think about the community on the outside, but we also have to uh, think about the staff and the people who utilize these devices on a daily ba basis from the inside, and both uh, play hand in hand together to make sure that everybody feels safe utilizing the equipment that uh, the schools are uh, implementing. Uh, that makes sense, thank John, you. John, can I jump in there for a second? Please. Uh, to kind of uh, piggyback off of Chris and what Rick had been saying, I think both of them really have nailed it in that, uh, uh, you know, yes, we're trying to do as much touchless, but really I think one of the things I want to emphasize to the group listening today is just the importance of quality access control. Uh, you know, you made the point that you've uh, walked up and pressed the button. Uh, Chris said the same thing, that you walk up, press the button, and somehow it just unlocks. No one said a word to you and the door's open. Well, we can extrapolate that and move on to either other uh, doors as well. Uh, you, you can probably drive around many high schools, many uh, several middle schools, and you'll see someone has a, either a rock or a brick or something that's got a door pried open in the back. And I understand they're going to baseball practice, they're going outside for physical education, they're going outside for playground duty or whatever the situation. I understand all the reasons behind it. But uh, I, I think what what security directors and those people, uh, the administrators here listening today, needed to understand that I think if, uh, if you educate those teachers and those coaches and those people as to why we're trying to keep our building secure, the really the importance, I, I would say do not hesitate to bring them in the loop and say, look, uh, you can look at uh, Nicholas Cruz who gained injury to Marjorie Stone and Douglas uh, High School by going through a side door, uh, tapping on the door and one of his friends opened it up and, or a person opened it up and he just walked on in. Uh, students as well as the, the faculty need to know that everyone needs to go to the front door and those that come to the front door need to be vetted and uh, then turn to us for the technology solution and to, to limit the amount of touching of, of doors and handles and those kind of things, but uh, some of it does rest uh, on the shoulders of uh, you folks listening to this program today. And uh, don't feel uh, that you're imposing on faculty and students. They really want to take a, an active role in their own security. Yeah, Bruce, I think it goes back to engaging, right, on, on everybody possible and, uh, and empowering them and uh, getting them involved in the rules and the expectations, right, whether yes. they help the rules or whatever that looks like and and the more you do that i think they're less likely to do something against those rules and regs right nobody nobody intentionally wants to put anybody at harm so thank you uh the next question would be uh which which products and services are you having success with in the educational sector from uh, electromechanical door hardware all the way up through cloud in uh, uh video management deployments uh rick so um to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Bruce said, sometimes we get caught up about the products and the technology pieces and forego really the common sense and the policies and procedures of the K-12. Um, and that's part of that consultative selling role. Uh, sometimes customers will ask us for the really complex solution to control an opening. And sometimes it can be as simple as just changing the lock hardware to a fail safe lock that can't be left unlocked for out of forgetfulness, ignorance, or even maliciously compromise an opening. Um, I've said in many sessions like this and very educated, intelligent people, but one thing I've learned in the marketplace what positions us uniquely as that systems integrator. Um, we work with the customer on the electromechanical openings like fail secure. Um, in the past, there was a lot of use of mag locks and there still are some use cases for that but then it's become a vulnerability to if someone pulls a fire alarm pull station, we just unlock the perimeter doors or those controlled openings. So we have to really look at security from the perimeter, from an access control, 
and then throughout the entire facility and, and mitigate um, risk. And these people that have malicious intent at times get more and more educated. So we really look at the opening from a standpoint of how we control the opening um, in a duress situation, how can we control the opening, uh, fire conditions, um, non-fire emergency egress conditions. And what's unique, um, I think that we all bring to this, and it isn't always talked about, is leveraging the customer's environments. And what I mean by that is their technology environments. The interoperability we're talking about is coexisting inside the customer's platforms, meaning their network infrastructure, their storage solutions, connectivity between their buildings and provide like school wide or campus wide solutions. So a lot of these products and solutions can be deployed autonomously to openings. But then if we leverage investments the schools already made in technology, we can deploy virtual VM environment application software for their access control and video surveillance. We can leverage the customer's existing network attached storage for their video surveillance that gives us more compute resources to leverage like the video analytics. Uh, some of the things TJ was talking about. So I think sometimes we get looking at the door and then we get looking at the video and we talk about the integration, but you need a technology person to help bring all of this together. And there's certain network impact as far as bandwidth, VLAN configurations, you've got server configs for the, the, the application software. Um, we're seeing a tremendous move in the marketplace too, where a lot of customers don't want to own that server. So you're looking at a lot more cloud-based solutions and cloud managed solutions. And like hybrid models, video surveillance is still an on-prem type solution for storage, but then we're giving the customers tools, cloud managed tools to manage that content. And it gives them remote eyes and connectivity, maybe during a, a, a not so good scenario. So I, I think as we, as an industry and solutions providers need to really bring a holistic approach to that customer. And you touched on it, John, from just the mechanics of the door and the service around the door, leveraging the customer's infrastructure. It, it, it makes the cost sometimes to, to enter into a new environment more, more affordable and it, it allows us to scale as well. And, and then all the way to cloud on-prem solutions that it gives the customer more choices. It gives them more mobility capabilities to view and manage their their platforms from tablets, from phones. And um, it, I think it's our job really to connect the dots within the customer's platforms. Um, this is true in commercial industrial and it's more adopted there, but I think in the K-12, they're like silos and we really wanna reach across into other business units within the school corporation and, and leverage that technology. Yeah, that makes sense, Rick. I, I think that if you if you show show the simplicity of, of, of you know some of the entry ways to get in um, for the packages, and then and then you can show it scalable and get further down the road, I think you'll, you'll be better off. And we have to be aware of demographics. There's some areas in the country that they may not have some of the technologies uh, compared to other areas of the country, and uh, and we need to be aware of that as we're creating uh, entry points and so forth, right? and and figure out ways to protect. Uh, we, we, we have a, we have a, a, we have a responsibility to protect everybody and, and find the best way to do it. Um, when determining, uh, what technology best fits in a specific school environment, what are some of the internal questions that school security directors should ask themselves? Uh, Bruce. Well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, uh they need to ask themselves about the vulnerabilities and, and what are we, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, last night, I was with a customer, at a, a high school customer. Uh, we're looking at their basketball, or I'm sorry, their football stadium. And uh, so the first question I asked him, I said, well, Scott, I said, to, what, what, are, what are we trying to do here? What, what's, what is your, where are your pain points so we can address that? He said, well, okay, let's talk about this. I've got, I have fighting in the, in the, in the bleachers. I mean, parents that get upset with one another, push and shove and fight. I have vandalism. I have people come out after dark and paint my field or they destroy some of my stuff. And, uh, I, you know, I've got issues of, of bullying that goes on different places. I want to be able to, to see it. So that my next question was, okay, to what level? You know, I use what I call the IRI method. It's the information, the recognition, and identification. Uh, access cameras, uh, many of you know, are very high quality, and we have a solution in about every environment. So in this particular environment, I said, 
do you want to just see and note the time and date something happened at the information level? Or do you want to see the recognition level? You want to see who it is and be able to tell you the gender, the race, the height, the color of shirt, those kind of things. Or do you want to really get to identification? You want to see the color of his eyes. You want to see pock marks on his face. How far do you want to go? And he's, his answer was, I want to be at the recognition level. So we, we brought some cameras, put them up, and showed him what it was. And he felt good about the solution because now he says, I think I can, when I have a situation where somebody says something, now this is for forensic evidence. It wasn't necessarily that they're going to have somebody monitoring it. But they can if they wish. But I, so I think that's the first thing you have to do is assess yourself. You say, what are my vulnerabilities? What am I trying to achieve? Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, bullying or is it, like TJ was talking about, is it vaping? You know, 27% of our high schoolers today vape, and it is a, it is a growing number, and it's a scary number. Uh, so we need to do more in that, and we partnered with folks and uh, to try to, to combat the same issue. So I think a lot of it is kind of like what Rick kind of alluded to. It's listening first. I think sometimes we as the professionals and we who are the technology solutions uh, think that the solution we've got is, is the answer, but, you know, we've got to listen first. So if, if I was out there today as an end user, as a security director, I'd say, okay, I gotta know where my pain points are. What am I trying to do? And then turn to the professional and say, listen to me. This is, my, this is the problems I'm having. Is it COVID-19? Is it I'm gonna have to go to every other day or every third day of students in my classroom? Do we have a solution for e-learning? Uh, do we have a solution for my bullying? I have a lot of bullying issues in my middle school. And, and then you can evolve and you can bring your technology solutions in together with the policies and procedures that the school district or the school corporation has. Makes sense. You have to ask the questions and, and listen to what the issues are to really address yes. it. And, uh, and then you, you get yourself a long-term customer with the right technologies, uh, you can solve their issues. Um, and if anybody has any questions, uh, the chat chat's not working, so you can put it into the Q&A section, okay? And uh, then we'll be happy to answer those. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, vaping was a significant health concern and disruptor for schools. Uh, what is your company doing to help uh, stem the vaping concern? And uh, I mean, Bruce just gave a great number. Uh, David, uh, uh, David, maybe you can answer to that. And uh, I, I think you have a phenomenal device there right over your shoulder, so please. John. Um, so honestly, since COVID-19 hit, it really made it more important to be able to stop kids from vaping because COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. Vaping is affecting everybody's respiratory systems with young kids, especially uh, going down as low as third grade. So what's interesting is that, you know, it's as important today to stop the kids from vaping as it was pre-COVID. Uh, Halo has 12 different sensors in it. Um, it does vape, vape with THC, it even does advanced smoke detection, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, propane, natural gas, chemical detection, temperature, humidity, air pressure, light levels, and then a whole other side for audio analytics like keyword detection. Bruce mentioned before about bullying. Well, Halo can actually pick up noise differentials. And what I mean by that is if a hallway or stairway is really noisy between 9.50 and 10 o'clock, it will ignore that. But if at 10.15 there's a loud noise or a fight breaks out, in a bathroom or in a locker room or in a stairway or hallway, Halo can trigger those alerts that this is not something that's normal, uh, which is where it has its intelligence and the artificial intelligence start learning and getting smarter as time goes on. And obviously we've added the gunshot detection as one of the newest features to it. So um, Halo plays an incredible role in deterring vaping into the schools, but now it's moving away from those areas of privacy into every room of every building in the world. And that includes hallways, stairways, classrooms, principal's offices. Uh, if you think of a camera as your eyes, Halo is your ears and your nose. It gives you the additional senses and the additional um, intelligence to be able to react to situations. Very good, thank you. So it's, uh, it's, it's, clearly, it's clearly something that I think the schools are gonna, are gonna need, that they're gonna want. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, is, it is one of those things on the forefront of all of our minds and, uh, aside from the fact that it's illegal to whack yourself upside, your, your kid upside the head on something, you'd like for them all to learn and understand, and if not, we'll have the guardrails on to corrective action that, that situation. Um, here's, here's one that's close to uh, all of us because we've all been working out of our houses for so long. Uh, I happen to be back in the office today, but uh, in general, and, uh, and the kids at home doing e-learning is, uh, 
is we've all gotten a pretty good taste of how things operate. So uh, e-learning and virtual learning has become popular and uh, an alternative to crowded schools and, and potential spreading of the COVID-19 virus. What does access offer in this environment to help school students keep a safe distance? So Bruce, please. Well, first of all, John, we have been listening. Uh, we, we have uh, been listening to our security uh, professionals, our, our, our senior leaders. I have been on countless calls since uh, middle of March, April, uh, talking to school administrators <clears throat> about e-learning. Well, first of all, it started with how is it going? Because in March and April, they were doing it. And I can say, by and large, uh, we probably got a C across this country. Uh, I think some school districts were certainly not ready at all. And some have uh, been progressing to that. Some of our academies get an A plus. So, but by and large, I think countrywide, my personal assessment, we probably got a C to a, to a C plus. So, can we do things better? Yes. Now, and Chris talked about this earlier. You know about uh, getting back to school, and and uh, John, you shared the story that you know that your school district's going back. Yes. So, how are they going back? Well, a lot of the folks I hear. It's going to be probably students wearing a mask. It's probably going to be students going to every other day or every third day. If you take a normal school year, which is 180 days of attendance, you could easily divide a classroom into three, and each of the school uh, students would, would be spending uh, the same amount of time in the classroom. So that means the e-learning piece comes in. Well, Access does have a broadcast quality camera that, that, we, uh, that we have that's available. That can uh, that does pan tilt zoom and follows the 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 person speaking. So if the teacher is wearing some type of a, uh, a uh, speaker system, then that camera will follow that that person. It can connect to Facebook, uh, Instagram, a lot of other social media sites to make it very easy for a student to come on board. We've got some uh, some superintendents that like the idea because I think they are going to go to either abbreviated schedules or every other day or every third day attendance of the students. They might be uh, skipping lunch and going home soon after lunch. They probably, sad to say, are going to drop some of the classes of the arts, uh, you know, uh, the arts classes, uh, the music classes and things like that, which, you know, I so no disturbs a lot of us. But uh, until we get a better handle of the COVID-19 situation, uh, I think these are some of the things that they're doing. But it starts with us listening. And our camera system, I think, is something of broadcast quality that uh, – I think schools could possibly utilize uh, in their in their effort to, to better improve their e-learning situation. Very uh, helpful. Thank you. I, I think that uh, I, I I think that the uh, from what they did say, it's going to have to be a mixture of both, right? It's going to be the the e-learning and uh, and the on school on site learning and uh, and being able to navigate whatever that looks like depending on the school. Please, David. Absolutely. Did you? Sure. Yeah, I'd actually like to add a lot to uh, what Bruce has to say, and uh, those are very good points you made, Bruce, with the V59 camera is an incredible broadcast uh, camera. We use it extensively in a lot of our applications. Um, we happen to be very expert on instructional technology. I have a whole other division, aside from IP video, that does STEM learning for schools. We have over $100 million of our STEM labs in New York City schools. So we've been very involved in educational content and learning, and one of the key things is going to come up as Bruce mentioned with the splitting up of the classes and, and some of the kids being home, some of the kids being in class. How do you now present that technology to the kids that are home? So it's just like they're in class. And the V59 coupled with a product that we call AV Fusion, which is our lecture capture recording systems, amazing way to be able to present that technology, get it online and get the kids seeing it and recording it simultaneously and keeping it on their private network. So it's not necessarily a, a public uh, thing that can be hacked easily. Um, so we're, we're big proponents of that. The other part is Halo uh, is about to release a uh, SIP endpoint compliance to it. So it actually can work for social distancing. If you use an access camera and you're able to use analytics on that camera to determine when people are too close to it together, you now have to make an announcement that you have to distance. Halo has that capability to be able to broadcast message that can uh, come directly from a VMS platform or an analytic that's, that's doing that. We've done over 40 integrations to Halo that allows us to integrate to every VMS that's out there, many, many access control platforms, building management systems, lighting systems. So our whole thing was building it as an open platform to integrate and serves a lot of functions in this area. So uh, I think it's a, a nice addition uh, to be able to tie some of these products and some of these manufacturers are on this call with us together. Well, that makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes people need reminders that they're a little close, right? So that would be very helpful. Uh, there continues to be a, a worst case threat of a school shooting situation, right, that we all think about. Uh, how's your organization prepared uh, or addressing this concern? So David, maybe you can speak to that. Sure, so Halo, um, this is Halo, by the way, for everybody to see. Um, it's a uh, you know, relatively small device. It installs with a PoE um, power network cable right into here. Uh, you drill a five inch hole, pop it into the ceiling, open up these little wings right over here and it installs in five minutes. But one of the new capabilities that we just announced uh, about a month and a half ago was that Halo now has gunshot detection built into it. So the people that bought Halo a year ago and paid the 1295 MSRP, $1,000, $1,100 street price for Halo, all of a sudden got a brand new feature that every one of the Halos they have now has gunshot detection. And gunshot is going to be critical because all the kids that are home right now, there's a lot of built up frustration. There's a lot that you can analyze of kids going back and there's going to be a lot more situations in schools that people have to address uh, from a psychological side of things. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, issues that can come up and gunshot detection is one thing that's critical to the schools as well as the bullying that we discussed earlier with Halo being able to do that. So it's kind of a good fit into this as uh, kids get back into school in September. And is that technology uh, for, the, for the extra technology there, is that already built into those units or is that something that has to be upgraded? No, it's built in, it's just a firmware upgrade. So all of a sudden yeah. they yeah. did a firmware upgrade and they got all these features at no additional cost. Um, which was, was really exciting to be able to release it to everybody. And uh, there was a huge amount of excitement around that. Very nice. TJ, maybe you could help out and answer that also, please. Uh, John, I'd love to. Yeah, so, um, you know, kind of um, uh, expanding upon that gunshot detection. So with, uh, with Spico, we have, uh, through our Secure Guard VMS, we have, and I talked uh, briefly about it earlier, about our uh, Spico Secure Guard um, uh, text alert notification, right? So we want to make sure that every person who has this mobile device has the ability to be notified in the event of an emergency. And uh, a few years ago, as everybody knows, the Pulse nightclub was a, an awful event, uh, completely tragic. Uh, and it got our wheels turning. We said, you know, what do we do? How do you notify people that are maybe in a noisy club, school, whatever it might be, that there's several buildings on a campus and if somebody comes on campus, how do we notify them quickly enough that they can take some action, protect their students, and and uh, you know quickly get to their protocol of how they have to handle an active shooter in the classroom. So uh, we developed this uh, Spico text alert notification, and basically what it does is it integrates with gunshot detection and other technologies. It could be a panic button, it could be whatever. And if God forbid somebody comes on that campus uh, with ill intention and they shoot that gun. Uh, the gunshot detector would go off, it would integrate, send an immediate text message to my device. If I'm the teacher and I'm giving my lesson plan, I have my phone out on the desk and my text alert is going to pop up and it's going to say, active shooter on campus, initiate your lockdown plan. And I want to give them more time because uh, that gunshot detection is a verified um, alarm, right? It's a, a verified event. And if somebody comes in and pulls the fire alarm, you don't want the kids flooding out into the hallway. You want them to say to the teacher, hey, this is a gunshot and stay where you are, protect your children and do what you have to do. And that, you know, combined with the facial recognition, we could, you know, the, the local police department uh, can send an image over and say, hey, this, this person made a threat against this particular school. And we can have that image uploaded into the system uh, with that camera, whatever that device. And when that person gets close, it could say there's a, you know, an 87% chance this person is on your campus right now and notify the security team, whoever it might be, so they could take action and, um, and resolve the issue before it becomes an issue. So that's what we're trying to do is get a few steps ahead, uh, really understand um, how the system's working, get it to the right people, uh, you know, in a timely fashion, utilizing current technology. We also have an app. Uh, it's a secure guard app uh, that can turn a an iPhone into a, a mobile IP camera. So you put it into a chest strap. I put it on my security guy. He goes out to identify a situation and it becomes an additional channel on through the secure guard VMS. And now I can see that come up and I can see in real time what's happening at that particular location with audio. So it's, uh, you know, it's important that we kind of tie all these things together. And, you know, like David was saying, it, it's critical. The gunshot detection is top of mind for everybody. So that's a, a solution from Spico that uh, we can offer. 
And TJ, is that an enrollment process there? If I'm on a campus, is there an enrollment process? Is, uh, yes, so it's a great campus? question. And thank you for, uh, for adding that, John. Yes, this is an opt-in. So you would opt-in to this particular, there's a code, so you'd opt into that code. Uh, the teachers would opt in, or if it was in a different environment, maybe it's a, you know, a, a movie theater or a nightclub, you could opt in for a period of time and then it could time out uh, after a certain period of time. So you, you just know you're protected so you can get notified. But great question. Thank you. Now, I know this is a little goofy, but, but if you have a child that is at a university, could you opt in and still receive that message if you were off campus, even 100 miles away? You could. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it is through mobile networks, you could receive that. Surely. Okay. Very good. And John, John, I want to jump in here for a second. I want to Please, kind of Bruce. jump off of a kind of piggyback off of what David and TJ are saying. The importance of this about active uh, assailant. There's, and, and some of your viewers may not uh, uh, know about this, but there was a report that, uh, that was submitted in uh, November 2019 by the United States Secret Service. Excellent report. Uh, it was it covered by I think, the years 2015 to maybe 2018 active assailants and the number and the things. And the critical piece that, that, that you take from that, that TJ and David uh, talked about and why their product is so important, is that the average time of an active assailant uh, in the United States is less than four minutes, three and a half minutes. And almost all of them, some 87% were over in five minutes. Uh, so most of those, well, 87% of those uh, law enforcement or an SRO never had a chance to even interface with the assailant. So that's how it's critical that we get the earliest alert to either uh, shelter in place or to make an escape, uh, you know, for those students to do that or for law enforcement to get the earliest activation they can. Uh, you know, we are not ones that access to, to uh, try to frighten our customers with active assailant, active shooter situations, but we're also uh, experienced security professionals who study the statistics and the reality of it, and we realize that this is important. And if active assailants events last three and a half minutes or less, we've got to do something on that provincial level. We've got to do something to increase our speed to save more lives. Completely agree. Thank you, Bruce. Um, just switch it up a little bit. Bullying is a consistent cultural issue that schools are facing and have been for decades, let's face it. Uh, what are you doing to help schools address bullying? So David, please. Sure, so, you know, both uh, TJ and Bruce, you know, just hit it on, on the head. So, you know, TJ's mentioning about the integration of the products is what's critical, being able to have those alerts and be able to communicate that information quickly to people. And Bruce mentioned about, we, we call it time equals life. You know, those few minutes that you have to early respond and have all the systems tied together is what's so incredibly critical. So Halo had the initial thing for the bullying part, which I mentioned before, where it can pick up on, on a uh, noise rise in level that's not normal. But the other really cool thing that we released along with our gunshot detection was keyword detection. And keyword detection is, it can wake on a specific keyword like Halo Help and wake up and trigger an alert, including potential two-way communications over SIP um, and communicate with payphone systems, with you know, products from, uh, from Spico, from you know, <laughs> Access or VMS, we can communicate. So it starts to tie all these things together. And that's the real key to this, is about integrating all this technology together. And Halo kind of falls in the middle of it. It's the IoT smart sensor. You know, uh, we, we, everybody has these smart homes. But to move that to the enterprise and have smart IoT buildings for schools, Tynal's technology is really the key to bringing this all together. Um, so that's what you know, we've kind of focused around and we keep doing the integrations. We have over 40 integrations so far for Halo and we've done it and designed this from day one as an open platform to integrate everything and everybody uh, in the IoT space. That's our whole um, goal with it. And are those keywords ones that you've already programmed in or are those keywords that the, each school can put in for their own own self? So currently, uh, there's a single keyword is what we released. In a future release, it's going to allow custom keywords. So right now, we have a specific keyword you could use. I could trigger it right now. Um, Halo Help is not the keyword. We don't uh, do that onto broadcast. It's, it's given to the school districts. But that will be a programmable function on Halo in the future where uh, next release will actually have the ability to program different words into it. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, do you have anything to add here? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, you know, uh, 
a lot of our analytics uh, access have is on the edge, but this particular product that we uh, have partnered with, uh, it's called Sound Intelligence. It really goes right to the heart of the bullying piece. And I think uh, David and TJ both are of similar products, but the importance of it is it, we know there are a lot more fights uh, in schools than there are shootings, thank God, right? Uh, so, but, but we know there's, there's a certain amount of fights and scuffles, uh, bullying events that goes on. And so uh, Sound Intelligence is an analytic that works off of our VMS, uh, works through our camera, through access cameras to the VMS. And what it does is uh, it can send alerts to, uh, to school administrators when it sees a baseline change in the level of noise. So you could be in a crowded cafeteria or a crowded uh, media center, and it has learned through AI what that baseline of, of uh, information or sound is. And then if somebody screams or yells, what if, what if it was a knife attack? What if it wasn't, uh, an, it was an active assailant who was using a knife or, or some type of a bladed uh, attack rather than a gun? Gunshot detection would not work. So this is an analytic that we have that uh, will look at the bullying issue, will look at the active assailant that's not using a firearm and still send alerts to the uh, school administrators and start that process of a quick response. And is that from, that's from the camera or what is that, what is that from? Well, it, 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 uh, it rests on, this, on, the, on the camera in that it, uh, it's the, the camera is also the, has a, the IO device for sound and it's listening for this, but actually this analytic uh, is uh, uh, an ACAP, what we call an access of camera uh, application pro platform on the VMS system. So, but it's using the camera and using our uh, sound system to to pick it up. It's very good to use around uh, the bathrooms and those kind of things. It's uh, excellent in the cafeterias uh, where you might have a scuffle or a fight, or you might have an a, a active assailant with a blade that would come in and attack. Sure. Thank you. Uh, has your organization pivoted or uh, repositioned products? in the present climate we're facing. Uh, Chris, please. Yeah, fortunately, APhone has an extremely diverse communications portfolio where a complete uh, pivot wouldn't be necessary. Um, our hands-free capabilities uh, in terms of wave detectors is not new, um, but the demand for those features are new. And the IX system that we have is robust in the sense that it can um, not only create a touch-free environment util utilizing existing equipment and third-party devices on on inputs and integration, but also consolidate communication systems needed throughout the given building. So the IX system itself is, is a platform, and this is one of those instances that it was kind of touched on earlier, where we are listening to the customer's demands, where if you know anything about the legacy systems that we had, where it would be the, the AX, the IS, the JOJP, all those systems are were singular, kind of isolated systems. Well, the IX system is now on the second generation of this platform, and the benefit to the customers with that is that it makes it easily adaptable and modified to fit the, the needs. So the, the pivot itself isn't necessary. It's just the messaging on these features that we, that we already can provide is necessary. Um, and prior to COVID, we would, we would recommend like a wave sensor or something like that. And I guess the one thing that would change is now we provide a wave sensor. And the benefit to that is now uh, that we're a single source provider for, for the entire system when it comes to, uh, the hands-free environment and utilizing, so the IX door station itself has a PoE pass-through on it. So when incorporating a wave sensor, specifically no extra wires are needed in, in, in terms of tying it into power, you can take a wave sensor right into the PoE uh, pass-through. So long as you have PoE plus going to the door station itself, uh, they're good to go. So uh, the, really the pivot is generally speaking, the messaging that's delivered based off of the customer's needs, not so much product itself. Okay. Very good. More than explaining and, and understanding. Thank you. David, how about yourself? Do you have anything to add there? I, I do, actually. And, um, you know, uh, Chris makes some good points. But one of the interesting things that we've done with Halo to address the COVID environment right now are, are, are three separate things that Halo does. One of them is air pressure. And if you have multiple Halos positioned throughout a building, we can determine air pressure. And the air pressure is critical to the airborne spread of germs. Uh, in hospitals, as an example, an operating room needs to maintain positive air pressure to keep the germs from flowing in, whereas an isolation room, where they want to keep somebody who has germs, has negative air pressure. We can actually communicate with the building management systems through BACnet, which we just completed that integration, and be able to control the blower units to maintain positive air pressure to affect the flow of airborne germs in a building with HALO. 
On top of that, a lot of buildings are going to sanitize in their buildings with airborne chemicals that they use to sanitize the buildings at night with fogging sprays. Halo picks up those chemical contents in the air and gives them a confirmation that the building was actually sanitized properly. We can actually see the concentrations of the chemicals that were put in the air and how long they were sprayed for. So we actually pick that all up. And then uh, the last is we just released our AQI or air quality index. And air quality is extremely important for people's health, especially people that might be asthmatic. And we can now measure air quality inside a building at different parts of the building. And that can be controlled then with external dampers on an air conditioning system. So in our own building, our carbon dioxide levels build up during the day when people are in our building. And it's not healthy to be in high carbon dioxide, not carbon monoxide kills you, but carbon dioxide buildings. And we are able to allow them to control dampers and control the airflow um, using that, that uh, sensor that's on HALO, which is, is another pretty cool part to it. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so, so we have uh, one more question and then we'll go to the, the Q and A chat. So, um, uh, what, what are, what are some of the new technologies or what are some of the technologies that you're working on around school securities for the, for the future? So, uh, why don't we start with TJ? TJ? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, for Spico, you know, we are uh, going to continue with uh, trying to, you know, increase the size, the perimeter of that circle of protection around our kids before they go into, into a school or higher education. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the mobile piece is, is certainly important, but that mobile piece has to integrate with uh, what they're using uh, at the actual building where they're monitoring all the security. Uh, so we're working towards that and making sure that it's fully integrated uh, across, you know, a, um, an actual building or an entire district, uh, utilizing our server platforms, uh, our browser managed access control products, uh, being to be more, uh, being able to be more mobile, right? So I can use my mobile device where I can, you know, from outside of the building, I can determine, you know, threat levels and and assess uh, different types of lockdown procedures. Uh, we are, like others, are working towards the, uh, you know, the vaping and smoke detection, um, you know, um, uh, violence detection, loitering, all those uh, newer technologies that are, you know, coming on like uh, like crazy here. We're uh, right on it and we'll be releasing it uh, shortly. So we, we will have a full solution. And, and Spico's goal ultimately is to, you know, of course, provide security, highly encrypted matter because it is a school and everybody's hi hypersensitive to the data and where it goes. And, uh, and um, so that's, you know, a big um, priority for us, but also becoming a manufacturer that pulls a lot of solutions together uh, in one, um, from one manufacturer to make it easy. So if I go into my access control system, I can see my video, I can see all of the things that tie together without having to leave an application, go to a different one or you know, heavy licensing fees and things like that. So we're thinking in terms of installation time and profitability for the manufacturers, but we also have to be very cognizant of um, the uh, end user needs and the needs of that school district, so. Very good, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, David, yourself, anything to add? Sure, um, you know, we've been very, very focused uh, on open standards and, and being able to tie into many different systems. I mentioned the 40 integrations we have. So one of the big things that's coming next in July, we're gonna be releasing a cloud portal to be able to manage large numbers of the payloads uh, as well as other systems that we can communicate with. So we kind of become a gateway to communicate with all the other systems that are out there through our cloud portal that will actually start to accumulate over a million data points a day per halo uh, of information. And that information is what's critical. We're in an information society right now. And we don't know, we don't know until we start collecting that data and Halo starts to collect that data. Then we can start to present it back to people in meaningful ways. And then you can start to do predictive analytics on what's gonna happen based on history and, and things that it can pick up in it. So it's kind of interesting, but uh, the cloud portal is the next big one that's coming, that's coming in July. Very good, thank you. Um, what I think we'll do now is, is uh, we have a little bit of time, is, uh, is go to the questions that were coming in. So, uh, uh, which, is, which is fantastic, love seeing these. So please, if you have any more, please just send them into the uh, Q&A &H, Q uh, section here. Um, this one comes from Jeffrey Kelly. Uh, who do you envision picking up the integration costs between the different technologies that we're introducing? So I, I guess for the, uh, the schools or whatever the case is, and I think as an integrator, you're probably thinking along those lines of anything that you have to integrate and, uh, and putting in for your hours. But uh, uh, is anybody interested in taking on that question? Um, I, I can speak to that some, and, and David just alluded to that a little bit. 
as I did about like best in breed manufacturers. But in today's marketplace, he talked about having a cloud portal where there's a lot of integration that can happen in the cloud. And there is a lot more interoperability on basic communication protocols. So the cost of integration today isn't as heavy burdened as it was in the past because it's, I like the word more interoperability based on communication standards and protocols. And I kind of touched on that previously when we talked about just market leaders that are driving standards that allows disparate systems to become more communicative and not be just siloed. And the data points he's talking about have use cases for security, for fire prevention, for you know air quality. And in the past, those things were very siloed product sets. In today's marketplace, it's kind of standard operating procedure to start building products that communicate to third party systems. Um, it's a huge trend in the past five to 10 years in this industry, but that, that's part of our job as integrators is to pick those partners to give us those choices and more flexibility for our customers. And my thoughts. Thank you, Rick. All right, very helpful. Um, what about the Halo product line for the cannabis industry from uh, Joe Camerata? So we've gotten a lot of requests for that, and it's a perfect fit into almost every vertical market, uh, including airlines, um, commercial buildings, hotels. Uh, there's an application into medical, into almost every vertical market, and cannabis is no exception. Halo has light sensors on it. It can tell us light levels that the plants are receiving. It can also um, be able to measure humidity levels and air pressure and a whole bunch of other things that are relative to growing of cannabis. And on the flip side, you can put this into a bathroom where you can't put a camera and make sure you're monitoring your own employees to make sure that uh, you know, they're not uh, testing the product, which they're not supposed to be doing. But again, that's uh, some of the applications. So Halo is a perfect fit into a lot of uh, applications within the cannabis industry. And we have quite a few inquiries and we've been in conversation with quite a few organizations over that. So I, I think you said in here 1 million data points. I, I assume that that was you, David. Was that you that said there's 1 million data, data points on there? That was, yeah, we, we uh, basically create 1 million data points per day from Halo with all the 12 different sensors that we have. And then we were able to combine the data from those into very, very meaningful reports. Um, initially, we're doing it into pivot tables, but now we're actually uploading our data into an artificial intelligence engine to be able to really do that predictive part of it, which is what I was describing before, and being able to start to predict events and also to be able to display it in a much nicer format to people. Very good. Very good. I, I was actually somewhere yesterday. I can't remember the doctor's office or where, but uh, as for a checkup, and I, uh, I and, and this this did come up. Um, are are there uh, any end users that are asking for the ability to track and record who's in the facility, right, for the purpose of contacting tracing, uh, contact tracing with COVID nineteen? That's a good question, right? You want to know kind of who's who's been in there, in the facility. And I can't remember if I was a repair shop or where I was, but I filled it out. And just said, yeah, I was here. That way they could contact me if some COVID had, had shown up on somebody that day, right? Um, is anybody, uh, or do you guys know if any end users are asking for this uh, from a technology standpoint? Anybody? I can tell you that they are asking. are asking that. Yeah, I think that they are asking, uh, certainly. And uh, it's a touchy subject in some cases, and there's privacy concerns and uh, whose face and how much you can you know, record. But... Uh, you know, I can talk to you from, from our standpoint, our O2 TML uh, temperature panel, um, you know, has the ability to record up to 20,000 faces. So, and you can register folks and you can do it like facial recognition. Um, but, you know, what I say, contact tracing, you know, you have to, again, be careful. I don't want to go out on a limb and say, okay, yeah, definitely it's something that I would use for it. But, uh, but it is certainly being asked. And I think it's a, a valid question. I think it'll evolve over time where, uh, you know, a lot of people will use it. Uh, but again, it's a, a little bit of a privacy issue as to who's asking for it and, and where did they go. Very good. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, this is interesting. So this is, this is really for uh, uh, first responders. So are there any uh, uh, current integrations between VMS, access control, and shot detection systems? So first responders can, uh, uh, it can, can see active shooter situations at a school and they can see the real time and have access to it, maybe on a, on a video or a handheld device of some type for the active, uh, or for the first responders. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
uh, thinking along the lines of, you know, firemen, policemen, so forth about the school and how that ties in, right, from a technology standpoint. And John, I, 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 John, let me jump in here. Uh, not that Axis has uh, that particular solution, but we have a solution that's very similar to that. We have a partner called Mutual Link. It's a company that's based, uh, it's out of uh, Connecticut, if I believe, right? Uh, we all know, especially those end users on this call, the interoperability, the radio, the, the data, the video interoperability we have today. And so if you had uh, either David or TJ's or, 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 or sound intelligence, uh, that analytic that's working, and it can send a, a, a real-time alert to law enforcement, which is a, certainly capable to do. Mutual Link is a connection, that one of our partners, that can actually uh, eliminate that interoperability. What it does is has the ability uh, to, in a predetermined uh, MOU, so to speak, that you have with the school district, that if they have an event, they, if they, that, that law enforcement or that fire department, that EMS gets an alert, that they have the ability to connect to the video, connect to the access control, connect to any other uh, uh, data point that's in that school just for the duration of this particular event. If it's an active assailant and they get, maybe it's a sound detection alert, then they're able to look at the cameras, they're able to lock the doors, they're able to uh, pan, tilt, zoom those cameras that have the ability uh, and essentially take over. If you have audio in the building, uh, which access has uh, audio capability, it's IP audio, that they would be able to communicate, send messages, those kind of things. We think this is a, a key thing. When I was a, an end user, I, I, I purchased Mutual Link. I was sold on that product because we had issues of our SROs were on one frequency. Our teachers and principals were on another frequency. Uh, our uh, uh, law enforcement people, uh, our, our full-time law enforcement people, the school district, where they were on their own frequency. So this brought it to, together with a flip of the switch just by going to a web portal, a flip of the switch, they're all singing off the same uh, radio frequency and they're all able to see the same video. Awesome, thank you. That may not be a solution that ADI has, but, uh, but I will say that uh, extremely important and I think that uh, uh, any first responder would, uh, would like to have that ability to uh, participate in, uh, in that to support the schools. Um, the last question, that we have, and I actually think I can answer this, but I'm gonna allow David to, so, <laughs> is uh, can Halo or Access listen to specific words and alert based on those words, like known common slurs, et cetera? So, so the good news is that uh, just like with chemicals in the air, we were able to create signatures of hairspray, body spray, different things that might confuse a normal sensor with vape, we can filter out for those. Same thing with audio. We actually have the ability to actually capture audio words and be able to listen to them and listen to the patterns of them. We don't record them, which obviously be wiretap. We're not allowed to do that, but we can identify different sounds, just like we're recognizing Halo help to be able to wake. We can also recognize other words that we've trained the device to do. And if we recognize those slurs or things that we feel could be harmful or require attention, we still can't record them, but we can alert somebody to those events happening. Um, so yes, we have that ability to do it. And that's in development to add those additional words and signatures as we call them for. Thank you, Dave. Down the road. <laughs> so what, what I like to do now is just uh, I'll go around to each, uh, each of the, the expert, the panelists here, and uh, just have them say a couple of, couple of words, anything that they might have, have to say, and then, uh, and then we'll close out. So uh, why don't we start with Chris. Chris, uh, anything that you'd like to say to the group, uh, specifically in regards to uh, uh, today's panel? Uh, not really specifically. It's more of just a thank you for ADI for hosting this event. I think this was informative on my on my part to hear everybody involved and all of the experts in their various um, roles and how we can all help. Uh, one thing that we kind of all have in common in, in terms of uh, what's near and dear to our hearts and that's schools because we all either went to one or we have kids that go to one. And I think it's important because if we're in the communities of of where school, schools reside that we all take it as seriously as possible to um, give them the best advice and encourage them to to move forward with platforms that can keep everybody safe and feel secure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, TJ, yourself, anything uh, that you'd like to say? No, I, you know, like Chris said, you know, thank you to ADI, uh, all the other panelists here too. I think uh, everybody did a great job of uh, providing their solutions, and uh, you know, hope so. 
hope to uh, work with uh, some of you in the future too in integrating some of these great technologies. So, um, no, uh, just I hope everybody you know stays safe. If uh, Spico um, can you know be a partner for you, or you, uh, I've offered us some solutions that might be of interest, please feel free to reach out and go through your ADI branch managers. Come to us directly through our sales team. But uh, really appreciate the time and uh, thank you again. Thank you, TJ. David, yourself. Sure. Uh, yeah, I want to thank ADI. This was a great presentation. You brought together a good mix of people, which was, was great. I think it uh, shared a lot of good information with everybody. Um, education has been near and dear to our heart since uh, I, I started that division in 1998, uh, being very involved with K-12. And, and what was very funny is when I got involved with K-12, we realized the good we were doing, and we put that in front of profits. And to us, it's extremely important that we have successful outcomes and don't, you know, misrepresent things or, or put stuff in front of schools. So, you know, to us, this is a great, you know, conversation that was had here with some quality products from some quality manufacturers. And the biggest thing for people who are listening is not to be misled by products that claim a lot that don't deliver a lot, because right now we don't want to give a false sense of security. School safety and school security is number one, and we have to protect, you know, our children. So that's that's extremely important to us, and I'm glad you put this together for that. Thank you, David. Bruce, yourself. Well, I too want to thank ADI for hosting this. Uh, thanks, John, for for moderating, uh, and thanks for the panel. It's a great job. And I want to kind of jump on what David just said. Uh, you know, I too want to offer my services personally. If you can feel free to reach out. If you need some uh, consultation, you need something. But David really struck a chord with me because, you know, especially in COVID-19 uh, times, not not the legacy because we're still in it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, companies that are they're trying to respond to that, and uh, I would I would just suggest that you stay with proven companies. The folks that are on this phone call, we've been around for many years, and they're good security professionals, and I know these people, and they're good folks. And it's important that you that you go back to you know the folks that have been is, in this for the long haul, uh, security consulting, security uh, end user, and now a security manufacturer has been my life, all in the school world. And uh, it's not like we're just jumping onto the COVID-19 uh, craze or something else. So uh, that's all I would say. And, and feel free to reach out to me on a personal level if you need a uh, shoulder to cry on when you're the things you're experiencing or you want some consultation or you just want to talk about products i'm certainly here for you so thanks john for hosting thank you bruce rick yes sir um this is a little redundant but i, I do appreciate the opportunity um with you john and adi to, uh, to be part of this and um our intent is kind of what bruce touched on is to really educate everyone that joined us on this call. I, I too learned some things on this call. Um, and Bruce touched on this too. It's really important to lean on people that do this for a living. This, this isn't a hobby for us. Many of us, 30 plus 40 years, and I've become one of those more distinguished gentlemen in years of doing this. And I get frustrated at times when there are these opportunists, opportunist to do things that isn't in the best interest of our customers. So on behalf of myself, all of course, and fire and security, if there's any way we can contribute, my time and energy is here to contribute to this discussion on this panel, as well as in any other marketplace. So um, I, I agree that I learned a lot on this call. I appreciate the opportunity and um, let us know how we can be of service to anyone on this call, including you other panelists. So I appreciate that. Thanks again, John. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I can remember back uh, uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s when I was going to school, we didn't have we didn't have the, the kind of challenges that we have in today's world. Uh, back then, it was just uh, fire systems, upgrade fire systems to make sure that some of the uh, uh, the devastation that had happened in fires in schools uh, wouldn't happen again. And I can speak to some of it in Chicago alone. That was a, a very a real challenge out there. And somehow, whether it was Columbine and then everything else that had happened thereafter. I think it woke us all up uh, from a security standpoint and the challenges that are out there. So my hats off to the, uh, the suppliers and the integrators that have gone out there to tackle that and make the schools a safer place. And uh, at the same time now addressing the COVID, uh, the COVID uh, issue that's going on, uh, it's affecting all of our worlds. So uh, that being said, I, I do believe uh, what, in what you say, you know, look for the experts, 
look for the people that know what they're doing. These are, these are our kids. These are the ones that we need to protect our future and uh, they are the future. So uh, uh, again, I appreciate the panel, appreciate your time, appreciate the attendees and uh, uh, everybody's commitment to today. And uh, if anybody does need something, uh, uh, please reach out to ADI. We'll be happy to tie you in with any of the supplier partners. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, everybody have yourself a safe and, uh, and, and good week here, okay? Thank you. Bye now.